Yes. Someone be able to object and say, well, why is, I, I mean, someone who doesn't believe that the Quran is from Allah, they believe that it's from Rasulullah. Why would he want, isn't he being possessive over the woman that he married and saying that they can't marry anybody after him? One can make that argument, right? Why is he being possess, possessive and not, uh, you know, allowing anyone to marry his wives after him? One can make that argument. So what, what is our counter argument? Someone who doesn't, let's say, believe in Quran, believe in God. See, we who believe in God, we believe this is the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the law of the Prophet. The Prophet did not legislate on any of these laws. Allah wanted it that way. So you ask Allah why, not the Prophet. He had nothing to do with, with this law. But someone who doesn't believe in Quran, someone who doesn't believe in God, if they were to make that objection, what's our answer? Or one thing I've heard some... Uh, um, Islamophobes or critics of Islam, they mention along these lines is, why did he make an exception for himself to marry more than four? If you see a leader making laws to serve himself only and not others, doesn't that raise doubts about this leader? How do we address um, objections like that? Let's think, let's brainstorm, this is important. You will be asked about this one day, I guarantee you. Any ideas? Both, whether it's the four wives, that special ruling, or this law, why is it that the Prophet's wives, they cannot remarry after him? Why? Why this special treatment for the Prophet? Because the four wives thing, times were different, it's not like it is today. It's not as okay. Clear, you know. okay, someone could say, I'm a king, I'm a social leader, I need 10 wives for these purposes. Does Islam allow me? No. This only applied to the Prophet, not even Imam Ali Imam Ali according to Islamic law, he could only have four permanent wives. This is a special law for Rasulullah. So if someone says, well why this, pref this, this preferential treatment, why? This leader of this religion, he's taking advantage of these laws for his own purpose. That's the argument, how, how do we respond to that? Wasn't it because also I heard uh, some of his wives had certain circumstances? He had, to, he had to marry them? So his wives had certain circumstances, okay. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll build on that point, that's a good point. What else? Well, based on historical evidence, I mean, a lot of the wives of the Prophet, they, weren't, they were either divorcees or widows, um, or widows of uh, others who got martyred in war. Uh, from one standpoint, another fact within history was to bring people closer from the different tribes, perhaps. In the different so there were these purposes were these behind purposes. the marriages of the Prophet. What if I have these purposes? No, let's say a, a, a community leader says, I have these reasons why I want to marry more than four. And, and the reasons verbally, they're valid. Yes, he wants to bring peace between this tribe, there's a widow, he, he wants to take care of her, there's an, uh, a, a little girl who's uh, abandoned and now she's a teenager or 20s and nobody's taking care of her, he wants to take care of her, whatever, I can come up with a number of reasons. How come that doesn't fly with me? Why is it only with the Prophet of Allah? Uh, that's the counter argument. <laughs> no, that's a good point. We'll we'll build on that. You ain't the prophet. That's good. Hold on to that thought. Yes. Well, whoever is now coming and making this argument isn't going to be a role model uh, that's going to be emulated by billions of people. But this man, when he has those needs or whatever, now anybody can come and say, "Well, I have." So no one is a role model like the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ so the Prophet in being the prime role model, no one matches him. So it was appropriate to have this role model marry these women in order to send a message. Whether it's taking care of a widow, whether it's to save a broken family, whether it's to bring tribes together, so on and so forth. The reasons that we mentioned or to break adoption or to break racial barriers, whatever it is. He was the most fit character for that. And to build on that, you said you ain't a prophet, right? To build on that, 
See, other people can come up with uh, with reasons, right? But because this is an area where desire and temptation usually plays a role with men, how do you trust that the man is legitimate in his reasons? See the Prophet, we believe he's infallible, so if you're a Muslim you believe he's infallible, so you trust him because God has already purified him. So if the Prophet says I'm marrying because there is a higher reason why I'm marrying, she's a widow, I want to take care of her, we trust him. But if another man says it, even if he seems to be a pious man, how can we trust him? Maybe it's because he wants her and he's just, uh, you know, justifying it. How can we trust that? With the Prophet we can trust him 100%. Now if you're not a Muslim and you have doubts about this, you're like, well you Muslims trust your Prophet, I don't trust him. I tell, I tell this person, look at the track record of the Prophet and his history and you will have certainty that he did not marry for personal reasons. Number one, the Prophet when he was in Mecca and he was you know, uh, advancing the cause of Islam, what offer did the Mushrikeen make with him? They told his uncle Abu Talib, look what is it that your nephew wants? Does he want to be the king of Mecca? We'll make him the king of Mecca, just stop this new religion. Does he want women? We'll give him our finest woman. Why didn't he take, to, uh, take this opportunity? If he was a man who was concerned about his personal desire and temptation, why did he not take advantage of this opportunity? What does that tell you about his character? When he was younger, the Prophet in Medina, he was older, millions of things were on his mind, wars every day, you don't have time for these women. In Mecca, he had all the time, no war, no trouble, peaceful, he's in his uh, 40s, he was 40 when Islam started, right? When you're 40, do you desire women more or when you're 60? <laughs> no seriously, and at what age do you have more energy for women? More time, exactly. So when he was younger and less headaches in Mecca, that was the prime time to get the woman that he wanted, but he refused that offer, why? Number two, look at these marriages. Look at these marriages after the Prophet We'll talk about Sauda soon, why he married her. Why would you go after a widow who's relatively old when you can get one, someone younger, why? Uh, number, a number of the women were widowed, Um Salama, Um Habiba, Sauda, they were widowed, why do you go after a widow? What's the point? See that tells you there is something, this man through his life, his track record, we know he had a higher goal, it was not about desire. So when you put those together, it gives you confidence that he was not a man of desire, because he wasted all those opportunities. If he was really a man of desire, why didn't he take them? But can't anybody over here make the same argument, Sayyidina, if there's a person who's been living for 40 years or 50 years? They were busy in their career, for whatever reason. They don't have a track record of perhaps uh, getting together with women for whatever reason. And then he decides to have, go marry, five or six widows just for this, the purpose of Allah, but he's not allowed, so how can you justify that? So we tell this person that for the sake of well-being and for the sake of the general good of society, it's good that you have that intention, but Allah has limited it to four, because more than four, there will be negative consequences, people will try to take advantage of the law, so for the better of society, even if you as an individual, you seem to have the good intentions, but Allah has limited that for. But with the Prophet we know he's an infallible and his track record indicates that, so everyone knows the Prophet is a special case, no one compares to the Prophet, he's unique, other people may be good, but they're not at that level. They don't have that track record. They may not have had the opportunities the Prophet had to demonstrate their will. So for the sake of the respecting the law, you just put a general law. Because then who's going to make those exceptions? The person says, no, I have good intentions. I want six widows. Well, who says? 
Well, somebody else can make the same claim and then no respect for the law. And then you have uh, people who have maybe money, exploitation, they'll end up marrying 60 widows and taking advantage of that position. Islam said, no, no, put a limit, not more than four. Before Islam, there was no limit. Allah says, you have to put a limit. Even with that limit, there are conditions, of course. But with the Prophet ﷺ, you can make that exception without sacrificing the greater good in society because everyone knows he's a unique situation. Everyone has seen his track record and he's receiving revelation. Remember the Prophet performed miracles, remember that. And I would tell these Orientalists, go and study the miracles of the Prophet. You don't follow him as a Prophet, you cannot deny some of his miracles. So there is something unique about him, so yes, why it's okay if he gets a special law that's applicable to him, because nobody in history had his position, his position was unique. So that's one way of addressing it. About the Imams, they were infallible and they were very genuine. The Imams were infallible, but remember, not everyone uh, admitted that they were infallible, right? So if if Allah opened the door for Imam Ali and others, well, no, I want Umar and Abu Bakr to have the same thing. He's a companion, they're a companion. See, it, 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 it leads to other consequences. So yes, in principle, in principle, Imam Ali is also infallible. So if he has these other reasons, it should apply to him. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not want to open that door because the companions would have taken advantage of that door. They would have said, what, what do you have that we don't have? You're a companion, we're a companion. If you are allowed more than four, we're allowed more than four. They would have broken the law. So for the, for the greater good, that, that could not apply. But Sayyid, we started this uh, question in terms of explaining it to a non-Muslim altogether, right? So even amongst us Muslims, as far as the different schools of thoughts are concerned, they don't even understand the concept of infallibility and they don't consider the Prophet infallible. How would you explain that to a non-Muslim altogether as far as what infallibility is? So I would say to them, yes, for me, the Muslim, the, our, my Prophet is infallible. So I trust everything he says. But for you, you don't see it that way. Look at his track record. Let's examine every single incident in his life. Let's analyze it and let's see where he made a mistake, where he made a violation, where he used his temptation and desire and he sacrificed the greater good. Let's examine it. So when you study the life of the Prophet from age 40 till 63, there is not one single instance of that. And in fact, all indications are whenever there was a personal opportunity for the Prophet to meet his personal desires, he said no. So I tell him, see that, look at his track record. You as an objective bystander, by, bystander, you're just looking, see, see what, what, show me, where is it that the Prophet uses temptation and desire? So I, told, I would tell him, you don't believe in infallibility, fine, but show me where the Prophet made a violation. They cannot produce anything like that. Yes, they might cite some weak hadiths, Bukhari and others, which I don't recognize, right? I would dispel those hadiths anyway. But according to what we believe about the Prophet, there's no violation. So that's one way to approach it. So we see that in this verse of hijab, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Muslims to observe this etiquette and Allah made a special ruling for the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And this happened in the house of Zainab. Yes. Even now, some of the wives of leaders they get certain statuses too. Exactly, like first lady, right? First lady, don't Americans view the first lady uh, in, a, in a specific way, right? So we, we understand the concept. Now the Prophet, for many, many reasons, Allah found it appropriate to give him that special status. Yes, that's a very good point. The, the wife of the king or president has a special status. So why are you bothered if the, the, the wife of the Prophet ﷺ, who's the seal of all prophets, who's God's greatest creation, has a special status. What's the problem? It's rational. <laughs>